Rescue Coordination Center uh, started receiving distress signals. The bridge was starting to fill up with water. The ship was sinking and got them out on top of the rescue boat. Winds up to 60, 70 knots. We started to separate one by one. Wave height 50 to 60 feet. I was, finally, I was alone and no rescue boat or nothing. The rescue boat drifted away. It's freezing out there. All I had to do was just wait and hope some kind of miracle would happen. There is almost no chance to survive in conditions like that. AIS, the automatic identification system, all ships out on the open oceans are obliged to transmit their position and their identity and their direction of speed, heading and speed, etc. It's kind of like air traffic control for the sea. It's very useful to uh, help provide assistance to, to ships in, in distress. First of all, to see do we have assets in the area that could help somebody in distress. In, in the days before AIS, we didn't even know if there were any vessels in a particular area where we have an incident. They were more or less invisible to the coastal uh, traffic administration. But as of today, if we have an incident out in open water, we have the chance to see what vessels are in the area and could contact them directly to route them to the position or the distress uh, and in, in that way, in a more effective way, rescue more people within a shorter time frame than we ever have before. AIS receiving stations along the coast, they can only look a certain distance out into the sea. Ships that go out beyond 75 kilometers outside the coast were over the horizon and invisible to us. But if you think about these signals going straight, they go maybe several hundred kilometers out into space. And you know what circles around the Earth about 400 kilometers above us? The International Space Station. The European Space Agency contacted the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment and gave them the opportunity to mount an AIS receiver on board the space station to test out this technology from space. All our calculations indicated that this should work, but we really did not know before we switched on the receiver on the space station. 1st of June 2010, the system was turned on. The switch was flipped and uh, the light came on and we were uh, actually able to get the first data in. Yes, the instrument works. We all got very excited. And, and suddenly we could see a whole world full of, of ship data. It was, it was uh, I would say, a quantum leap really in, in our ability to, to look at uh, global ship traffic. It's like a blind man starting to see. Yeah, it was a, a huge relief and, and, and great satisfaction to see. So this brought a whole new dimension to the monitoring of ship traffic on the open oceans. Nobody knew how many ships really are out there at any given time and, and uh, suddenly we had, uh, if not the complete picture, then almost the complete picture. On a typical day, the space station is observing about 30,000 ships out on the open ocean. I was kind of overwhelmed, I guess, by the response that's got. The space station really is an excellent lab for, for uh, testing this type of technology. This project demonstrates that the International Space Station is not just for science and astronauts, but it really benefits the whole mankind with down-to-earth applications. Based on the AIS, we had another vessels in the area that we contacted who continued to the area and they searched together with the helicopters. Nobody expected to find anybody surviving in that condition. They actually spotted one man in the sea. After floating in the North Atlantic Ocean for four hours, I was finally rescued. Thanks to AIS data and AIS data from the space station, 
this lone survivor was rescued. A absolutely happy ending for him. And luckily for technology, that made something that was basically impossible to survive possible.